Hello and welcome to The Napoleon Assist. Today I am joined by Emma Clary, a professor of English at Uppsala University, who is a renowned uh, expert on Jane Austen and literature during the early 19th century. Her most recent books include Jane Austen, The Banker's Sister, and the topic we're going to be talking about today, 1811, Poetry, Protest and Economic Crisis. Emma, I've been meaning to have you on this podcast for a while. It's great to see you. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Delighted to be here. Now, you have what I've always considered a kind of a wonderfully different perspective to what a lot of military historians might anticipate in terms of studying this period. And I, I'm conscious that this might not kind of occur to all of our listeners, um, perhaps because poetry and literature is, is that bit more metaphorical. And so the connections might not be so readily apparent. So for those who aren't familiar about your approach, talk us through how you come at, at looking at the Napoleonic Wars. I was studying, as the title of my book suggests, a crunch point in the war. In your website, I think you refer to events in the year 1811 as bloody stalemate, particularly in Spain. And the economic warfare that reached a climax at this time was also something that interested me. Each side was attempting to damage the other through trade blockades. You had the continental system imposed by Napoleon on one side and the British orders in council on the other. And I explore this history focusing on a single poem called 1811 by Anna Letitia Barbold, which caused huge controversy at the time. It was a poem predicting that Britain was doomed if it continued on the same policy path. Now, I guess what you're implying with your question is that there's a standard view that literature is something quite secondary when it comes to history, that it's a reflection of history. I suppose a more sophisticated view would be that there's a sort of feedback loop, that history feeds into literature, which then makes events meaningful and shapes the way people act. Um, it's worth noting, I think, that Napoleon himself was strongly affected by literature. Um, we know that the, he, he adored the Ossian poems, the Celtic answer to Homer, um, this uh, grand epic series of poems showing an idealized warrior society concocted in the 18th century really inspired him. Um, and someone wrote to him on one occasion, it is said that you always have a copy of Ossian in your pocket, even in the midst of battles. Um, but I was interested in a very special case, a work of literature that was designed to change events. Um, at one time, I was actually hoping I could title the book, The Poem That Defeated Napoleon. Um, sadly, I couldn't quite find that smoking gun. However, I think I did manage to establish that this poem was part of a campaign that successfully and dramatically changed British war policy. I really like how you put that, that there's a, a sort of a feedback loop here, because in a, in a way, even after, after I wrote the question, I kind of thought, well, is it correct that military historians don't necessarily see poetry as um, quite such the primary source that it can be? Um, because you, you've got things like poetry from the trenches. Um, so it was, uh, this is why I particularly like your work, because it was such an eye opener from my perspective to see how literature could really inform an understanding of this period. Oh, yes, of course. Um, I'm hoping to um, be able to give some resources, some links to material online um, in case people would like to follow up um, some of the great work that's been done on the poetry of war in this period. And set the scene briefly for those who aren't familiar with what is quite a complex world of novels and poetry writing. Um, um, I've got to say, some fairly vicious critiques that are published in periodicals during this period. Yes, the literary scene in the war years became extremely polarised along political lines following the French Revolution. Obviously, a lot of literature was escapist then as now. There was a craze for Gothic that really took off in the 1790s. Um, but at this time, liberal and radical writers used literature as a way of communicating their opposition to the government and the war against a backdrop of increasing censorship. 
Writers who supported the government in the war also tried to influence public opinion through literature. And there's a, a really nice example of this, which is, is very apropos. Um, John Wilson Croker was an Anglo-Irish lawyer. He was a protege of Arthur Wellesley's, um, the future Duke of Wellington. Croker was appointed as secretary to the Admiralty, partly through Wellesley's patronage. Um, and this was a key position in the war effort. He was also a poet, and he used poetry specifically to sway public opinion about the Peninsular War as propaganda, essentially. Every time a battle was fought, he rushed a poem out to the newspapers, glorifying Wellington and his troops. And this was especially important when it came to a battle involving substantial British casualties and with doubtful outcomes like Talavera in 1809. When Wellesley read it, he commented with his usual dry wit, I did not think a battle could be turned into anything so entertaining. Now, um, it also happens that um, this same John Wilson Croker, this protege of Wellington, a government minister, a patriotic poet, also happened to be at the person who anonymously wrote a crushingly negative review of Barbold's anti-war poem, 1811, in the Quarterly Review, and gave rise to a sort of myth about Barbold as the victim of a literary assassination that I began with, with in my book. This was my starting point. So um, I was interested initially in the way that reviewing was weaponized in this period. Um, the major review journals, the Edinburgh Re Review and the Quarterly Review were very widely read. And they subtly, or sometimes not so subtly, used aesthetic judgment as a way of trying to control the public conversation about current events, including the war. Even people mainly interested in uh, military history may know the poets like Walter Scott and William Wordsworth and Robert Southey were great enthusiasts for the Peninsula War. Wordsworth, Coler Coleridge and Southey, um, you know, they're, they're known collectively as the Lake Poets for their association with Cumbria. They had all been radicals, political radicals in the 1790s, but they became increasingly establishment and in favor of the war against Napoleon um, with the turn of the century. They transferred, if you like, all of that idealism connected with the French Revolution to the Spanish struggle for independence. Anna Letitia Barbold had actually been quite friendly with Coleridge and Southey, but she didn't agree. When the, when the Spanish War began, she couldn't get behind it. She said in a letter written after Talavera, I do not know how to rejoice at this victory, splendid as it is over Bonaparte, when I consider the horrible waste of life, the mass of misery which such gigantic combats must occasion. And as a result of this difference of opinion, the late poets trashed her, privately and publicly, often in very misogynist ways. I've got so many questions that I want to ask straight away. Uh, let's start with the censorship element because I, I find that endlessly fascinating. How effective is censorship of literature during this period? Because I think folks perhaps aren't aware, we, we often lambast Napoleon, quite rightly in my opinion, for the scale of censorship in France. But at the same time, there was censorship, um, albeit less obviously state-sponsored, but nonetheless state-sponsored, um, across a number of different art forms, whether it be caricatures, um, whether it be in, in terms of the newspapers uh, and bringing um, lawsuits against certain individuals. So how does the censorship of literature and poetry work during this period? Well, it becomes increasingly stringent. Um, you could say that when the war broke out, there was, there was relatively little censorship and a great deal of debate. You know, there was a, a really lively forum of debate and a lot of radical voices in it. Um, but the government, as the war began and began quite badly for them, um, tightened up on opposition voices. And um, so you get a whole slew of, 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 of laws being brought in towards the end of the 1790s known as the, the gagging acts. 
and quite a number of radical writers and publishers uh, fell foul of these and um, ended up in prison for shorter or longer periods. And I'm, I, I, you know, I will say, you know, I know that we're going to get into the immediate period of Barbold's publication and why she alone seemed to come up with this um, very overt opposition to the war. And that's the context really that I'm dealing with um, in terms of censorship, you know, what's happening then. And there were some really high profile imprisonments that happened at that time. And in terms of the influence, you were talking about the, the way in which um, critique can be used as a way of shaping the, the public discussion around certain pieces of literature. How successful do you feel the influence, the, the attempted influences of both sides, pro and anti-government were in setting the agenda for the wider public? Because this is an endless debate that exists, particularly within the context of newspapers, you know, do they shape or do they respond to public opinion? So what's your sense on that, both of those kind of elements? Interesting. Well, I mean, it's a very difficult thing to measure, um, but I guess that um, one measure when it comes to the periodicals might be how widely are these um, representations of the debate disseminated? How far do they percolate through the nation by being um, taken up by local provincial newspapers? And you can track that very well now through databases. Um, and also, I think, um, obviously, readership numbers is a good indication of how far um, a certain version of current affairs reaches. And the quarterly reviews, the Edinburgh, which I mentioned, the quarterly review, um, which was set up to counter it, were massive in that respect. We know that they had very high um, subscription rates. Let's talk about the poem itself then. It's an epic poem. Um, I'm trying to remember now how many lines long it is precisely, but it's it's a it's a huge thing. Um, it's it's almost sort of a, a pamphlet in its own right, more than a than a, a what people might sort of think of as I don't know a few standards of poetry. Um, tell people about the poem itself first of all. Well, I, I thought I might try and screen share the poem with you. Um, it, it actually was published as the pamphlet. So you're on there and it was 334 lines. So it's not massive. I'm just going to ki kind of quickly skim through it so people get a sense of um, its shape. Okay, it begins actually in quite conventional terms with a representation of the war as something sublime and overwhelming. Still the loud death drum thundering from afar or the vexed nations pause the storm of war. To the stern call still Britain bends her ear, feeds the fierce strife, the alternate hope and fear. Bravely though vainly dares to strive with fate and seeks by turn to prop each sinking state. Um, so at this point, you, you don't actually know whether it's an anti or a pro-war poem. These same, the same kind of language was used in both, for, with both perspectives. And then we get a kind of evocation of Napoleon that was also quite conventional at this time. Colossal power with overwhelming force bears down each force of freedom in its course. Prostrate she lies beneath the despot's sway while the hushed nations curse him and obey. Um, then we um, move on to an allusion to the Spanish War. Um, you can tell that because of the references to the orange blossoms, the olive groves. Um, agriculture is being decimated, there's famine in its way, in the wake of the soldiers. Um, and then we move to the home front. And again, this was a fairly sort of conventional, sentimental um, representation almost, um, representing mothers and sisters and uh, fiancés and wives, um, uh, grief stricken by um, the bad news from Spain, beauty mourns and the rose withers on its virgin thorns. Um, and I feel that there's a kind of setup here for a leap then, a sidestep into satire satire of the uh, pro-war position. 
um, and it comes, there's a sort of switch point um, where the, um, the soft one is bending over the map of Spain um, and looking at the newspaper. Um, so, um, or off the daily, or off toward the daily page, some soft one bends to learn the fate of husband, brothers, friends, or the spread map with ancient anxious eye explores its dotted boundaries and pencil shores, asks where the spot where her bliss is found and learns its name, but to detest the sound. So this is the, the kind of sense of loss, which is fueling a new kind of anti-war anger. And um, it from this stage, she moves to make some more direct allusion to thinks thou Britain still to sit at ease an island queen amidst thy subject seas while the vexed billows in their distant roar but soothe thy slumbers and, or, and but kiss thy shore and she goes on to say no you know Britain is about to suffer in the same way that Spain has done um, and it will be an economic shock um, Britain no thou who hast shared the guilt must share the woe thy baseless um, wealth dissolves in air away like mists that melt before the morning ray. And she represents businessmen looking towards the West, um, fearing that war is now going to break out with the United States as a result of the um, trade restrictions, the orders in council, which were causing a lot of friction with American trade due to the um, uh, interference with neutral traders like the Americans, above all the Americans. So all of this is, um, plus the impact of the continental system, is going to devastate Britain. Um, then, um, then she moves on to actually represent her alternative patriotic credentials. She anticipated the fact she was going to be attacked as an enemy of the nation um, by saying, oh, my country, name beloved, revered by every tie that binds the soul endeared. But her version of patriotism is um, one which values its cultural contribution to the world. Um, as, and, her, and the political contribution in the form of its influence in the new free Americas, um, American nations. And um, she's a great fan of, of uh, um, the American Republic um, and sees that as being the logical place for British, the greatest, the best British values um, to transfer to. Um, so uh, she insists she's a patriot. She starts going through a sort of pantheon of British greats who have influenced the new world. Um, and then she sort of moves into a sort of uh, dream vision. She goes through a list of the British greats, a lot of her favorite people. And then she introduces this personification of fancy, um, which leads the poet speaker um, into the future, opens the veil into the future. And the speaker sort of steps forward and sees this vision of Britain utterly devastated, a complete ruin, a wreck. Um, and she travels this wrecked nation in the footsteps of some American tourists who've come to view the old world um, in the way the British tourists did on the Grand Tour going to the ruins of Rome or Greece or the Middle East. Um, but all the way through it, there are sort of clues to topical meanings. And that particularly comes through in a way that might be interest military historians when we get to the ruins of um, the ruins of London specifically. Um, she has a sort of nostalgic vision of the greatness of Britain when it wasn't restricted, um, when free trade linked it to the rest of the world in a way that isn't possible during the war um, because of the orders in council. And then she eventually moves into um, the, the ruins, the empty shell of um, St. Paul's Cathedral, where monuments were being erected to the heroes, the military heroes 
of the um, of the of the war. And she praises Nelson. She praises Moore. Um, but the fact that these are monuments means that she's not going to praise Wellington, and he doesn't get any kind of mention at all. And um, this was picked up by the reviewers um, in the pro-government press. And so you get um, an enraged comment from a, a journal called the Anti-Jacobin Review. Mrs. Barbold ought to be informed that Britain was far from being satisfied by General Moore's memorably disastrous campaign. There's actually a footnote to Moore where she quotes his last words. I hope that Britain will be satisfied by my conduct, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, um, and, and so this is what the reviewer picks up on. This memorably disastrous campaign, which left a stain upon the British character so foul and deep, this is a quote, that only the, quote, triumphs of Wellington could efface them. So it was, it, she was touching on a raw nerve here by her choice of who she was going to memorialize in this ruined future Britain. And um, then, the, the final part has less to do directly with the war, at least not in an explicit way. She introduces another personification, the genius or spirit, who takes us on a sort of westward journey through the rise, rapid rise and fall of civilizations, um, again alluding to, alluding to the wreckage of, of the UK before ending up in South America on a peak. Um, in Brazil, what is now Brazil. And um, this is taken to be, let me just move to the very last lines. Um, Ardent the genius fans the noble strife and pours through feeble souls a higher life, shouts to the mingled tribes from sea to sea and swears thy world, Columbus, shall be free. Um, so this is the sort of spirit of liberty which Britain has lost through its participation in the war against France, and it's now migrated to the liberation movements in South America, which were just sort of nascent in this period. Um, the attempts to liberate the South American colonies from um, Spain. I actually read this as yet another satirical stab at the, at the British government, who were at this time trying their damnedest to set up trade links with the Spanish American colonies in order to boost financially the war effort in Europe and not having much success with it. And they were really caught in quite a difficult place because while they were sort of giving encouragement to the rebels in South America, they of course had to stay on the right side of the, um, uh, the, the official Spanish government, so who wouldn't agree to any kind of um, loosening of ties with their empire. So um, it was a sore subject. And I think all the way through in my reading, I'm sort of pointing out ways in which um, this was an attempt to unsettle and undermine and provoke a reaction from um, the powers that be in Britain, the people leading the war effort. This is incredible. I mean, there are so many things that come out of that. Let's start with her stance, because you mentioned earlier that she's anti the, the Spanish war and Britain's involvement in that. Why does she take that stance? Because certainly the British government endeavours, and, and there's ample kind of factual truth to support this, that Britain's involvement in the Iberian Peninsula is effectively engaging in a war of liberation from French domination. So on that level, you might expect her to like the idea of Britain kind of furthering the cause of liberty um, in Europe against the, the Napoleonic Empire. So, so why is she anti the Spanish war? Yeah, yeah. Well, yes, I mean, that's the journey, of course, as I said, that the late poets made, um, but she didn't make it with them. And it's a really good question. Why not? She was really quite a brave supporter of the French Revolution in the 1790s. Um, there's no doubt that she was sort of ide ideologically aligned with, uh, you know, 
a, a liberal verging on radical perspective when it came to politics. She wanted um, British politics to be more democratic. She thought um, suffrage should be extended. Um, she um, she's critical of all sorts of aspects of hierarchy in British um, politics and society. Um, but I think she was just very suspicious of the tenor of the um, British involvement in, Span in, 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 in the Spanish campaign. Um, and I think also that as a Unitarian, and I haven't yet spoken about her religious uh, uh, beliefs, she, um, she was sort of, she wasn't a Quaker, she wasn't absolutely opposed to all war, she was in favour of defensive war, and actually wrote a poem in favor of the volunteers movement at the end of the 1790s when there was a threat of invasion from Napoleon. Um, but she didn't, she wasn't in favor of um, a belligerent war, an attacking war, an aggressive war. And um, she thought it was unnecessary. She felt that there were other possible options, that there was room for a negotiated peace and that the Spanish campaign was, not likely to succeed and in the meantime was a horrific waste of um, life and resources um, both for the Spanish and for the British. That taps into something that I, I really want to come on to in, in just a second but before we do let me just take it back to the the, the section about monuments to, to Nelson and to Moore. I'm I kind of feel a little bit bad for her that she ends up being um, picked up on um, the, the the honouring of more, not least because yes, okay, the campaign was disastrous, um, and in all likelihood, if more hadn't died, then there would have been an inquiry into what went wrong. But it sort of strikes me, looking at it, that she's almost sort of playing it safe by honouring the dead, those who've died in the moment of victory, as Nelson and Moore famously did. Do you think that it was just a case of when folks were critiquing this, that that was an obvious um, thing to pick up on? You know, if, if somebody's going to honour more, the obvious counterpoint is that, ah, oh, yes, but the campaign was a disaster. We only pulled it out of the fire right at the end. Or is there something deeper going on there? Well, um, I think there is a lot to be said, actually, about the link with Moore. Um, I mean, Moore himself came from quite a liberal background and in fact she knew personally his father um, and um, his father was a writer as well and had written quite anti-establishment works of literature. Um, Moore was also well known for his very humane treatment of, of troops and um, anti-disciplinarian -discipl approach to leadership. Um, so I think there were all sorts of, uh, there was all sorts of magic, uh, baggage to be unpacked there. And um, I suppose um, the references to, to, to um, Nelson and Moore come as the climax of a whole series of quite tendentious candidates for memorialization in the poem. Um, she really picks and chooses and um, another character who she um, spent devotes I think at least four lines to is William Roscoe who was actually one of her allies in the anti-war movement um, and this again was absolute sort of salt in the wounds of uh, some of the reviewers they just couldn't stand it you know how can she celebrate um, the agricultural experiments of William Roscoe when you know she doesn't give a line to Wellington um, so all along there's something quite satirical I think about what she's trying to do and it's not at all surprising that the reviewers rose to the bait. And what always strikes me about this poem when I, I go back and I look at it again is that it's so representative of the uncertainties of this time mm -hmm. that was always what really kind of drew me to it when I, I first met you and, and heard your papers on this because it reminds us that there was no inevitability of the outcome of the war and that actually there was a, a significant body of opinion, it, even within the army itself, that the war needed to be given up, that this was unwinnable. So was, was that unique 
in terms of tone amongst the the civilian population because it's certainly not you unique within the army yeah i mean i think that's a really interesting question in relation to this poem the uncertainties of the time um because actually people in the day took offense um because the tone of the poem was so absolute and certain you know the poet sees a vision of england going down the drain in a not in the not very distant future um so the certainty of the poem the certainty of the vision is referred to again and again in in the reviews um but you of course you're right to talk about uncertainty and i do think that is that's a very relevant element of the background and the purpose of the poem uncertainty is really barbold's motivation for writing the poem this was a moment of major crisis, of potential turning point, and Barbold saw that the disastrous economic fallout of the trade war could be used to advantage, for the advantage of the peace movement, to force a shift in government policy. So her aim was to heighten the sense of panic, to encourage people to sign petitions, to abandon the orders in council that were helping to fuel the war, and ultimately to put pressure on the prime minister to seek negotiation with France to end the war. So, as I said at the beginning, the poem was uniquely strategic and involved in real world politics. And in sort of arriving at this view of it, I really drew some inspiration from a book by the political writer Naomi Klein called The Shock Doctrine, about the way in the 20th century, neoliberal economists pushed their agenda in the context of economic crisis that often went, went along with political and military crisis. Um, and I was also, when I was writing it, inspired by the credit crunch of 2007. You know, economic crisis is in the sub is in the subtitle of my book and that's why i wanted to investigate how a much earlier economic crisis had been pivotal politically and the uncertainty of, of a moment of crisis is is integral to that let's talk about the a little bit more about the, the criticisms because some of them we've touched on this already but some of them were utterly vicious almost you know if you if you're not involved in it then it, it's almost kind of comical how how almost playground some of the, uh, mm. the the criticisms were. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yes, well, I, I do talk discuss it at length in the book. I mean, some of the criticism, as you say, was it was apoplectic, um, like the anti Jacobin review I quoted a bit earlier, spluttering about the elevation of Moore over Wellington. Some of it was quibbling about her choice of imagery and her lines not scanning properly. Um, the implication was that she was a bad poet, although she was actually one of the most revered and successful of the period. Um, Croker's review in the quarterly is, is the one that's cited most often, and um, it was just pure ridicule aimed at destroying her credibility. Um, Croker called her a fatidical spinster, a prophetic spider, saying she has miserably mistaken both her powers and her duty, adding, we had hoped indeed that the empire might have been saved without the intervention of a lady author, and he caricatures her dashing down her chagrin spectacles and her knitting needles um, to write this topical interventionist poem. And, you know, what I'm arguing is that she's satirized because she's seen as satire and that the reactions of these, these, these hyperbolic reactions should be seen as the measure of the poem's success. You know, that this is actually our best, you know, our best guide to reading it and what it's about. Um, so my point is that 1811 was deliberately written as a provocation to unsettle the, raw, the, the war machine if you like. And the anger came because Anna Letitia Barber was hitting the mark. But, you know, it's also true to say that the poem divided opinion, even among people who you would have thought would be on her side. And a notable example of that is Henry Crabb Robinson, 
who I think is probably used as a source by military historians a little, yes? I mean, he was the first um, embedded journalist, you could say. Um, he spent time in Spain and, and was actually a witness to the, um, ret the, the retreat of Moore. Um, anyway, Henry Crabb Robinson came to espouse the war side, you know, the pro-war side, and wrote for the Times. And his diaries are very interesting as a chronicle of the period. Like, um, like Barbold, he was a Unitarian. They, their families knew each other. So he was a friend of hers. He, you know, they, they played chess together. They, <laughs> they took tea together. But he was one of the one or two liberals who, who were on record as denouncing the poem as cowardly and unpatriotic. Um, but what I tried to explain is there's a reason for this. It's not simply because they disagreed with, with the, the poem, but because they were in favor of the war. So again, this is sort of further evidence that the poem is actually doing its job. Yeah, it's meant to be divisive. To, to generate that kind of a reaction clearly means mm. that people are looking at it and going, this is a little bit too dangerously close to the mark. You know, we, we, need, we need to shut this down. If, if it had mm -hmm. been way off and, and hadn't been quite so eloquent and effective, then people could have kind of passed it off as, as something, uh, you know, almost sort of a, a, a mad rambling or, or something. You know, you Absolutely. could, could trivialise it that little bit more uh, effectively. I, I mean, the next thing I was going to ask is, is gender an issue? Obviously, the, the language that was used is incredibly misogynistic. So there are, there are two elements to that, I, I guess, because I'm thinking partly about the Bronte sisters who famously had to disguise their identity. They assumed male pen names just in order to get published. So is part of the problem for these critics that you have a woman expressing despondency in relation to a political topic? Or is it just that the fact that she's a woman makes it easier to use gender as a means of trivialising her? Mm. Yeah, I think more the latter, you know, thank you for raising this, because one of the main points I wanted to challenge was that this case was, um, you know, say a view that this case was all about gender. You know, I wanted to challenge the view that it was all about gender. That is that Barbol was attacked because she was a woman writing about politics, daring to express an unpopular opin opinion about politics in a, in a space where women didn't belong. Um, and I, I should say straight away uh, that unlike the Bronte sisters, she absolutely did put her name to this text. It was there on the title page of the um, pamphlet that was originally published. Um, I suppose, I mean, this brings me really to the main discovery that I made um, exploring the reception of the poem, and that was the discovery of the existence of a large, well-organized anti-war movement. And here, in this context, the fact that Boba was a woman was actually an advantage. She was less likely to be prosecuted. Um, quite a few prominent literary men were imprisoned for speaking out against the government at this time. Lee Hunt, William Cobbett are well-known examples. Um, Barbold's own publisher, Joseph Johnson, had been imprisoned at the end of the 1790s. But there was no precedent for a woman being arrested on the charge of sedition. And the other thing was that Barbold had a lot of cultural capital. She had clout within the culture and she wanted to cash in on this. You know, she had, um, she was, she was respected. She was a writer on education, on all sorts of questions of ethics and public morality. She was a very popular poet. She was a successful writer of children's books. Um, Croker mentions having been raised on them. You know, she, she was part of, you know, the fabric of the culture of the time. So it was, it was, she used that position as a woman writer in order to allow her views to be carried further. She was very well known in the world of literature. 
and as you say, when reviewers wanted to attack her, they used misogynist satire. That was the obvious thing to do. That, that was the best way to try and undermine, undermine her. However, male allies also got attacked through satire. For instance, William Roscoe, in the very same edition of the Quarterly Review that savaged 1811, the poem, also savaged William Roscoe's pamphlet against the war, um, kind of ridiculing him as an author of children's books because he also wrote for children. It was something that Unitarians tended to do. So um, there was nothing really unique about the fact that she got attacked. She didn't get attacked because she was a woman. She got attacked because she was anti-war. So again, she was part of a sort of phalanx, you could say. I mean, this is the way I put it, a phalanx, a sort of army of liberal nonconformists, Unitarian, almost all of them men. Um, but she was the one who was willing to put her head above the parapet at this particular point. It's really interesting um, because I think a lot of people will assume a Bronte connection, which is why I put the question to you. Um, so th because th this speaks to a, a, a bigger topic that people are, are less aware of and which will be something that I will explore in, in a future podcast about how actually women were politically active during this period. Yes, you have the public and the private spheres and you have those kind of those gendered roles. But that doesn't mean to say that women were silent, or at least women who were able to express a voice didn't take that opportunity on occasion. And I think this is a really nice example of that. Yeah. Yes, that's absolutely right. But I, I do think it became more dangerous as the literary public sphere became more polarised it was it was really savage i mean it was a cultural it was cultural warfare and a lot of women did not want to have their names dragged through the mud like this um there is some truth in the in the legend that um the savage reaction to the poem silenced um barbold i think she realized that it was a sort of martyrdom you know that her reputation would be trashed but she was she consciously made a decision to do it. She was really courageous, I felt, um, writing the book. And that was my conclusion, that um, it was a risk that she was willing to take. She was in her late 60s. I haven't mentioned this before. I mean, she was a veteran. And she felt that um, this was a good use of her cultural reach, um, even if it meant that her her symbolic capital was going to be reduced as a result. So you preempted what was going to be my next question, which was what was her kind of her personal reaction and also what impact does this have on her career? So on a personal level, is there any evidence that she leave diaries and letters kind of outlining her reactions to the attacks effectively that she received? Yes, well, um, this is a, a frustrating element in that, um, no, we don't, we don't really know. Um, a lot of the Barbold archive, she was a prolific letter writer. Uh, she didn't keep a diary that we know of, but um, she did have extensive correspondence with um, a lot of quite well-known cultural and political figures. Um, but her archive was being gathered by someone who was going to write, a descendant who was going to write her biography in the mid 20th century. And it was bombed during the Blitz, another connection with war. Um, and a lot of papers were lost. However, a brilliant um, literary historian called William McCarthy has now published a magnificent biography of Barbold. Um, it came out just at about the time that I was beginning the research on my book, and it was invaluable. Um, so any scrap, you know, he has combed every archive for surviving material and has been able to reconstruct a huge amount about um, the development of her very multifaceted career. But when it comes to her reaction to 1811, no, she doesn't say a great deal. There are just a few scraps here and there of evidence. The main evidence that she was um, that she was appalled by the reaction actually came from her niece. Mm -hmm. And I do take issue with it. I think there's a, a sort of protective attempt to 
defend her reputation following the war. They don't want to see have her 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 immediate descendants don't want her to be seen as um, primarily a political writer, and so they play down this aspect of her work, and um, they represent her as wounded and retreating into a shell and um, present this really pitiful image of her as a um, as a victim which really actually doesn't quite tally with the reality that as has now been established by other scholars like Michelle Levy um, she continued to publish and she continued to write she was always really predominantly in her own mind a scribal writer she was writing for a coterie a lot of her work wasn't published at the time she just shared it informally with people in her circle which was quite a large circle and um, and so she continued to do that. She continued to write poetry. She continued to write essays and some of them were published and she had no issue about that. She continued to write reviews for periodicals. Clearly, she wasn't crushed no, in the way that has sometimes been represented. No, as you say, she's she's active. So not kind of completely cutting herself off from from the world and, and never writing again. In some respects, was she a bit unlucky in the sense that we talked about how 1811 is a period that I characterise as the bloody stalemate of the Peninsula War, but if 1811 is the bloody stalemate then 1812 is, is the breaking of the deadlock. So is the fact that 1812 turns out to be such a transformative year, not only for the Peninsula War but also in terms of Napoleon's disastrous invasion of Russia, um, part of the reason that she ends up being critiqued to quite such the, the same to quite such that degree or does the timeline not kind of match up like that well you're absolutely right i mean i think that's a to, to ask that question um and that's a real military historian's question um after the the 1811 stalemate yes there were fast moving changes in the first half of 1812 when the poem was published it was published at the end of february and sometimes the events that succeeded that um, favoured the cause that Barbol was championing. For example, the assassination of the Prime Minister, Spencer Percival. That was a massive thing. Um, and then also the increasing concern in Britain about the risks of bringing America into the war on the side of the French. That was another massive thing. So, I mean, this was a period, this, this period of the poem's publication and immediate reception was, was a moment of high drama. The, the Prime Minister, Spencer Percival, was killed on the 11th of May. Um, the government abandoned the orders of council, just performed this dramatic U-turn in June to avoid the war with the United States and save and try to save the British economy. You've got the, the Luddites revolting in the, in, in the Midlands and the North. Um, you've got bread riots hap happening in all the major industrial cities. Um, you've got huge unpopularity of the government. I mean, when Spencer Percival is, ki is killed, there's immediately rioting um, and celebration of that fact in in large parts of London. Um, it really felt like a very dangerous moment. And then in early July, you've got the ship taking the news of the concession over the orders of council to America, passing in mid Atlantic, the ship heading to England, bringing the news that the United States has declared war. Um, so it was all happening at this time. And, you know, Russia was becoming unstuck from Napoleon's continental system and Napoleon was preparing to invade Russia. So we were coming into an entirely new phase of the war and the success in Salamanca in July was also part of this, of course. Um, so you could say that um, by July, the poem had become obsolescent, but I would argue that it had served its purpose. It had contributed to that buildup of pressure, which led to the policy U-turn in June 1812. And it led to an immediate um, boost to trade. 
and the economic catastrophe that seemed to be threatening the country was averted, regardless of the fact that a front of the war opened up in um, the Americas. Um, and the reception, the really negative reception, came not after Salamanca, in spite of the dates, but, you know, it was actually part of that moment of sour grapes because the pro-war side on this particular point over the orders of council had lost out. So in some respects, it might not have been the poem that brought down Napoleon, but it was very nearly the poem that prevented the Brits from burning the White House. Is, is that a fair comment? Yes, that's a fair comment. Yeah, I, I hadn't thought of it that way, but th that's quite true. Um, and as it was, I mean, the, the war in America is a strange thing, isn't it? I mean, it's yeah. it's it, it it happens in very, very gradual phases. And so the impact of it was not immediate. And it seemed all along, even at this moment, that there was a chance for peace in America and indeed a greater chance for, for peace with Napoleon. I mean, you've got William Roscoe standing as MP on a anti-war ticket and getting a lot of support in Liverpool. Um, in the end, he didn't win through, um, but it felt like this was a moment of hope for the um, for the this this really um, active se sector which had won the battle over the orders of council and now thought that they could push it further and actually bring about an early peace. So, as an example, what do you feel that 1811 tells us about much much wider attitudes to the Napoleonic Wars during this period? Well, you know, just following on from my last answer, I think the crucial thing is the existence of this peace movement. Um, I mean, not being a, a, a historian of, of, of the war in this period, I, I, I perhaps, you know, like a lot of people, had always assumed that the revolutionary and Napoleonic wars were inevitable. And there was pretty much consensus in Britain that France had to be resisted, especially during Napoleon's expansionist phase. And so, you know, when I began this project, I assumed, as a lot of literary scholars have, that Barbold was a lone voice. Um, but as I began digging in the archives, it became clear that the poem was part of something much bigger. And in particular, I discovered the key work on this topic, which is a, a, a book by J.E. Cookson called The Friends of Peace, Anti-War Liberalism in England, 1793 to 1815. This was published way back in 1982, but it, it hasn't been um, supplanted as the, as, as the definitive work on the subject. This is a book I really highly recommend to anyone interested in a more nuanced understanding of military history in this period. There was opposition to the war. And in the final section of my book, I sort of changed tack a little bit. I mean, having sort of worked my way through the poem and tried to unravel its so often quite cryptic meanings with the use of the reception material, mainly the reviews. In this final section, I, I kind of give a, a blow by blow account of what happens from the time it's published, almost week by week, through the events of early 1812. And, um, and, and what is, you know, what's happening at the moment that reviews start appearing and how does the reception history of the poem find its place as a sort of thread running through the events of this period. And a lot of the material that I drew on were parliamentary records. And the parliamentary records of this period show fierce debate on war policy at every stage. You realise that there were a lot of MPs who took a very dim view of Wellington until the victory of Salamanca in July 1812. Um, Henry Broom and Samuel Whitbread led a really powerful campaign against the British side in the trade war. Um, and so did, and, and, and this was backed up in an extra parliamentary way by some of Barbold's close friends like William Roscoe, um, who, and all of these were sort of promoting a great deal of um, extra parliamentary opposition um, 
encouraging a huge petition campaign led by the commercial interest in the North and the Midlands. And even the Luddites were on board, you know, they were, they were destroying machinery in protest against unemployment and the famine caused by the trade war. And they left messages referring to, uh, on the scene of their, of their destruction, you know, talking about the orders in council. So it was a, it was a, a campaign stretching across a really broad spectrum of oppositional groups um, cross class. And I just wanted to share with you an image, which is my frontispiece, the frontispiece to the poem. And we should say exactly. for listeners, if uh, you want to see this, the, the episode goes out on YouTube um, so you can uh, see the image and, and I'll also see if we can find a way to, to post it on Twitter or, or something so that you can actually see this if you're listening. So yes, this is um, a, yeah, it's not up there with Gilray, but it's very interesting for my purposes, um, the political spider. Now, you'll remember from the quarterly review um, attack on Barbold's 1811 that she's referred to as a fatidical spinster. And Another of the discoveries that I made was that it was a reference to the parliamentary debates um, where Spencer Percival, who's pictured here with a great big broom, um, the prime minister, um, quoted a poem um, by Alexander Pope about a, a, a spider of prophecy, a prophetical spider, a fatidical spinster. Yeah, so it's a sort of pun on the word mm. spinster. And um, he says, destroy his web, his prophecies in vain, the creatures at his dirty work again. And these words were actually spoken after a speech, an anti-war speech, prophesying a disastrous end to the war by Samuel Whitbread, you know, the, the radical Whig, um, who's, who's one, of the, uh, one of the insects caught in this web. Um, so, Barbold was just one of many voices of prophetic doom at this point. Doom was the kind of stock in trade, as you say, it's the rhetoric that was employed by the anti-war movement very frequently. And at this particular moment in early 1812, it got traction. You know, it be actually became effective and, and it mobilized an enormous amount of political effort outside Parliament. And that's why it was feared. So, you know, this image is actually, although it's, again, satirizing the anti-war movement, it's actually also acknowledging its power, this particular point. It is also a great caricature. I'm much a fan of caricatures. So <laughs> listeners, um, have a look on, on social media, have a look in the forum, have a look on YouTube. You'll, you'll want to have a, a look at that. That's, that's a great image. I. Jacqueline Writer famously runs something called Pop and Bingo on Twitter, and she's not going to forgive me if I don't ask about this lead that you gave me, that Popham somehow manages ah, to work Popham, his yeah. way into <laughs> this situation. How? How does he manage to get his beady nose into, into this one? Um... Right, yes, Popham. Okay, yeah, so I encountered Popham when I was researching that very last section of the poem, which was to do with the um, migration of the genius or the spirit to South America. Why South America? You know, but it's, you know, the poem is mystifying in many ways for a modern audience. It, you, you kind of, it carries you along. It definitely has punch. But some of the details of it do not immediately appear legible for a modern reader. And um, so it begins with the war, begins with the war in Spain. It ends up in South America. Why so? And so um, I came across Popham when I was researching British activity in South America. And um, famously, Popham, um, as part of his sort of uh, renegade spirit um, diverted from um, a commission to spend time. I think he was meant to be patrolling somewhere in well, off Africa even and um, began chasing um, 
French frigates or something across the Atlantic, ended up in um, South America and suddenly saw an opportunity to invade Buenos Aires. Is that right? Yeah, so they, that he's right? posted to the, the South <laughs> Africa station. They're, they're sent out to take the Cape of Good Hope yeah. and then goes on this uh, with Beresford, actually. So it's um, kind of topical because I was interviewing Marcus Beresford uh, a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> just this this mad uh, I tell you what let's, let's just go and take Buenos Aires partly I think exactly. to do with the treasure fleet um well, or, that's or it gold. you see it's the treasure it's the treasure fleet and so he was able to send back a whole load of bullion to um, Britain and this feeds into my interest in the economic crisis it was a credit crisis to some extent I mean this is I don't want to go too far into the details of this if people are interested please go and, and check out my book the currency had been made non-convertible because of the, the, the risk of running out of bullion. And bullion was needed, of course, to pay for troops um, and pay for allies in the European war. Um, it, paper money wouldn't do. And so they needed this money. And it seemed like manna from heaven when Popham sent all this bullion back to London and, and there, were, there was huge rejoicing. Um, but then things went wrong, of course, and he got unceremoniously um, booted out and um, brought back in disgrace to London. And um, so I think that part of the purpose of um, Barbell's reference to South America is to remind people of this really embarrassing um, situation. So Pum does not come well out of it. Um, <laughs> um, at this particular moment, the credit crisis was as worrying and um, uh, potentially critical at this moment as it was back at the moment when um, there seemed a, a, a possibility that South America was going to deliver the goods. See, knowing Popham's personality, I can kind of imagine him trying to spin this as people are writing poetry about me because he was obsessed about telling everyone about the great things that had happened as a result of his work. So uh, <laughs> no doubt Jacqueline is going to be sort of furiously uh, searching for your, for your book and, and keen oh, to find out Yeah, more. well, I'd love, I'd love to talk with her further about that. So what's next from you? What are you working on at the moment? You know, I this book on Barbold was it was a passion project for me I yeah I loved telling that story and trying to correct a view that diminished her and her greatest poem I it really drove me on and I also wanted to take a woman writer I admired and put her right in the center of a wide view of the literary landscape and the politics of the period Rewriting history with women at the centre rather than the margins can tell you new things about what's significant in history taken as a whole. And I think in this particular case, it gave a really interesting perspective on the question of public opinion, for example, the view of the war. And I, you know, I know that that's something you take a lot of interest in, Zach, and I do cite you, your wonderful you work. Yes, on, you were the first person um, to do it, actually. <laughs> I saw you talking about the um, the newspaper representation of um, sieges, the, the very controversial sieges in um, in in early 1812, and um, the way that you know potentially there's some kind of media blackout around them. So we have interesting questions about that that was great and you know I've really enjoyed having that um, th this opportunity to meet up with engage with um, military military historians um, it's it's been great and Southampton is a really good way to do that you you quoted me as being um, a member of staff at Uppsala at the beginning uh, or rather you cited me as being a member of staff at Uppsala and of course I was at Southampton for a very long time so we go back mm -hmm. a, a ways don't we and do. it was a great place because of the Wellington conference um, it's a great place to it was a great place to be doing this research um, Another string to my bow is Jane Austen. Um, and you mentioned my book for general readers called Jane Austen, The Banker's Sister. Um, when the Jane Austen 10 pound note came out in 2017, it wasn't well known her favorite brother, Henry. 
who acted as a literary agent for her was a banker who went bust in, an, in another economic crash at the end of the war. Now, everyone knows that Jane Austen is great on money in her novels. And I was able to bring some of the research I'd done for the Barbell book to understand better Austen's relationship with economics and with public events more generally. And since then, I was honoured to give the Wellington Lecture last year in 2020 at the University of Southampton, discussing the way Jane Austen was linked to Wellington through wartime campaigns in the empire in which her sailor brothers took place. And I'm planning to do more work on the global dimension of Jane Austen's life and um, the reception of her writings. Another writer who I'm very committed to is Mary Wollstonecraft. Uh, she's a writer who's known as the mother of modern feminism. Um, she's really important for me. I'm writing a short introduction to her life and work for Oxford University Press. And I'm doing a new edition of her two novels in one volume. She's quite a well-known figure in literary studies and now also increasingly in philosophy and political science. Um, but there's a lot about her involvement in the Anglo-French conflict of the 1790s that I think we've still got to learn. I'm, I'm super interested in her time in Paris from 1792 to 1795 when she narrowly escaped imprisonment and she documented the events of the revolution in letters and in an unfinished historical account. So those are my main activities at the moment. You've got enough on your plate, haven't you? That's, <laughs> uh, that's a hell of a workload. Uh, interesting, I was speaking to Sarah Murden a few uh, days ago about somebody else who was um, out in, in France at that time who narrowly escaped execution, who was actually, it turned out, involved in spying um, on the French and sending clandestine reports back to uh, the UK and making a huge amount of money out of it, sort of saying, oh no, the wheel's fallen off my uh, my carriage. I, I suddenly need £20,000 or something to put this right. In, an incredible story. Um, again, that will probably feature on a, a future episode. But yeah, wow, that's that's a, a lot to be focusing on. Emma, this has been a brilliant interview. I think it would have been really eye-opening for our listeners in terms of how a different genre that wouldn't necessarily readily occur to folks can really inform our understanding of the period. Before you go, where do people go if they want to learn a little bit more about poetry during the, the early 19th century, and particularly during wartime? Oh, there, as I said at the beginning, there are some really good resources out there. I will um, send you a number of links um, to databases and a few titles as well of works which deal more broadly with, uh, with poetry and with literary representations of the wars. Fantastic. It's and been a real pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. No, it's, it's been a it's been my pleasure completely. And we will stick um, those details uh, either in the description below, whether you're on YouTube or whether you're listening, check the description. There'll be details in there um, and also check the forum, the NapoleonicWars.net forward slash forum. And I'll put the details uh, into a relevant post when this podcast goes out. Thanks very much, Emma. This has been great. Thank you. Bye now. That was Professor Emma Clary joining me to discuss Anna Letitia Barbell's poem 1811. You can follow Emma on Twitter at Austin Economics. As you heard, Emma's books are available to order online now. And if you'd like to know more about the study of poetry in this period, Emma has provided some pointers which you can find in the description. Before you go, there are loads of ways that you can support this podcast for free. Remember to drop a like, subscribe, share with your friends and retweet. You can also help to fund The Napoleon Assist at no cost to yourself whilst picking up a colossal discount of 75% in many cases on military history books at Naval and Military Press. Just click the link in the description, shop as normal, and The Napoleon Assist will get 10% without you paying a penny more. A big thank you as ever to my incredibly generous patrons whose support helps to cover the production costs of this podcast. If you'd like to join them, get an exclusive 10% off books at Pen and Sword Books.
and contribute to the aim of taking the Napoleon Assist weekly, you can find out more at patreon.com forward slash the Napoleon Assist. Please bear in mind that there are different perks in each tier, but the 10% discount is universal. A particularly big thanks to my first commander patron, Ger Brown, and my mentioned in dispatches patrons, Rob Griffith, Alex Churchill, an anonymous Canadian, Brendan Teeling, John Haynes, Anna Vakulenko, Beatrice de Graaf, Lynn Dawson, Jamie Kingston, Rory Muir, James Bevan, Lucy Tatner, and Jim Deary, not forgetting my A Napoleon Assist tier patrons. As ever, you can find me on Twitter at ZWhiteHistory, and the conversation continues in the forum at thenapoleonicwars.net. Join me next time when I'll be joined by Rachel Stark, Kit Chapman, and Beatrice de Graaf, alongside Marcus Cribb, as we debate the greatest invention of the Napoleonic era. Until then, I'm Zach White. This has been The Napoleon Assist. Take care of yourselves, my friends. Stay well, stay safe, and as always, thank you for listening. Thank you.